Yes, excellent. Good. It was all vegetarian, even though I might have tricked some of you to thinking it wasn't. Um, but, um, well, we should walk the talk, live sustainably. So, now what we're going to do is we've, we've a huge lineup of speakers. I'm sure you want to hear from all of them. So, first and foremost, I'm going to introduce our third keynote speaker of the day. Aren't we lucky? We haven't got one, but two, but three keynote speakers. Uh, Richard Howitt, who's the driving force behind uh, the Integrated Reporting um, Council, started off st um, with um, accounting for sustainability way back when. So this, he's been passionate about this. Um, I won't take up too much time. I'm going to do quick introductions. Everything will be available on the website. That way, we give you more time to ask questions. So Richard, without further ado, I'll ask you to come up. Thank you very much. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you very much for inviting me to be part of this. And let's just get all of the logistics working. Just as we do that, I would like to pay great tribute to Ava Lindstrom. I think you've brought huge leadership to this um, area with your report. Uh, you very, very kindly consulted me and us as part of the preparation of your report and to have the opportunity to be here and part of this conference to take it on. And I can't thank you enough for that. I'm hoping your colleagues are going to help me at this point. There we go, hopefully. If you're wondering who's more anxious, it is them, not me, just at the moment. But that, that might swap over at some point. It won't. It's there now, so that's very good. So thank you. Thank you to the colleagues here as well. Ava, so thanks very much again for me. Uh, in opening this uh, afternoon and the panel that's just about to be held on audit and assurance uh, of uh, extended reports, integrated reports, sustainability reports. We use into sometimes non-financial non reports. We use interchangeable terms about uh, all of this. I want to really share three things with you in, this, in, the, in these introductory words. Firstly, this isn't just us in a room saying we want to do this, we think it's a good idea. There is cast iron research evidence. There is an evidence base that this is the right and the successful thing for us to do. Secondly, uh, of course there are obstacles, and we heard about some of those this morning. But this is something that is very possible for us to do. And thirdly, the audit and assurance, the subject of the panel that we're about to have, is an absolutely crucial element of the next phase as we develop sustainability integrated extended reporting for the private and for the public sector. Uh, and I do want to commend uh, what Sarah Jane from the GRI said today, I think she's, she's over there, about the joint work that's that is existing between the different reporting frameworks on what we call the Better Alignment Project within the Corporate Reporting Dialogue. Now, that probably sounds like a lot of words to you, but essentially it's not a set of different competing uh, fragmented different reporting frameworks and we're not sure which to choose. For some years now, we have collaborated together with the IRC as the convener, trying to bring this greater com comparability, consistency and coherence to the corporate reporting landscape with the ultimate aim of integrating non-financial with financial reporting. And we are in that process and Vin Bartels, who will be on the, the, the panel shortly, is helping us drive that. Uh, and I, I want you to be encouraged by that in terms of being more bold in, ter uh, in terms of adopting extended non-financial integrated or sustainability uh, re re reporting. Now, we heard from the Director General of DG Budgets this morning, and he said it's difficult for the public sector to do this. But we've, from the early 2010s onwards, had a public sector pioneer network and now a public sector network that are pioneering and applying this reporting. And you can see some of the examples of that 
here. And yes, you will see their service providing or project supporting organisations in the way that the European Investment Bank was talking about. You'll also see state-owned enterprises, very important in large parts of the world, but also in large parts of Europe as well. They've got an important role to play in it. But if you look there to the New Zealand Treasury, some of you will be aware they have a totally multi-capital budget. They were one of the pioneers in our integrated reporting um, pilot program. And they now have adopted a full multi-capital budget by their treasury, by their economic ministry. Uh, and uh, I remember, it, I was a, some people know that I was a member of the European Parliament before, in the European Parliament CSR rapporteur over many years and one of the driving forces behind the non-financial reporting directive. And I remember that we got DG employment of the commission in 2004 to produce what was called then its own CSR report. We've heard about the, the patent office in Europe this morning already. So it is quite possible for an executive to undertake this type of reporting. It's not simply something for project base or service delivery public sector organisations. And you will hear some people who will say it's impossible to audit this stuff because the methodology isn't there, because it's forward looking, because it's the long term and we can't have the certainty we need, that we're now engaging in scenario analysis. Uh, you'll hear all of those things said. But in this survey that was published last year in the Journal of Legal, Ethical and Regulatory Issues, a survey of 700 integrated reporting organisations, already 400 have assurance of one kind or another. And you'll see that Europe as ever is a leader and you'll see that 57% of that sample with assurance are across the different European countries. So the idea that it's too difficult to do assurance of these reports, again, is contradicted by the research, uh, research evidence. And then why we have to do it. You're all familiar with the Edelman Trust barometer that comes out each year. There is a massive shortfall of trust in the public towards private and public institutions. Actually, you don't need me to say that, do you? We all know that it's true. And this year, there was a slight improvement in terms of trust in the business community, but not in the United States. And, but, so overall, the, there's a bigger level of inequality this year that you can see there. Uh, it's still true that a small minority say in, those, uh, uh, in that survey that they have trust in business, 56%. But a minority say they have trust in governments and the public sector, 47%. So if there is an argument that we need to move in this area to win back public trust and support, that is more true for governments, for the public sector, for the EU agencies, and institutions in respect of today than it is for private sector or for private sector organizations. So the research evidence is strongly behind what we're all seeking to do. Now let me tell you that it is possible. So as long ago as 2014, on the left you will see the guidance from the International Institute of Internal Auditors on how the internal audit function can support integrated reporting. That's existed some, over some years, and many in the internal audit profession call themselves the champions of integrated reporting, and they're a member of our IRC council. But on the right, you will see the very important work that's going on currently in the, in the International Audit and uh, Assurance Standards Board, the IAASB. We went to them in 2015 and, and, and challenge them, ask them to produce guidelines for the assurance of what they call extended or emerging extended reporting. Uh, those guidelines have gone through now nearly a two-year process. They're in final draft form and the consultation is taking place at the moment. And so by the second half of this year, there will be international guidance on how you audit these reports from the body in the world which is responsible for providing that guidance, the I. A S B. And the challenge for this conference, for the Court of Auditors in Europe and for all in the public sector, 
is that there is a greater argument for doing this if you are a public sector organisation than, than if you are a private sector organisation. That quote is from the founding chair of the IRC, Professor Judge Mervyn King, the famous uh, author of the different corporate governance codes from South Africa. And essentially, any of us in the public sector understand and believe that we are creating value for the public that we serve. And the integrated, the extended, the sustainability report is a way of demonstrating that to the stakeholders or to the public to whom we, we serve. That, that license to operate is important for the private sector too, but it's even more important for the public sector. And so if we've, as we've heard this morning, the SDG platform of the European Commission, which I'm proud to be a member of, and I was a signatory to the report that says that we should have quantitative and qualitative reporting from the EU institutions towards the SDG goals. And on the right, the resolutions of the, the European Parliament that my good friend and former colleague, Heidi Houtler, talked about this morning, calling for Europe to do this. So there's a very, very strong call from within the EU institutions from this. And so two final points. One is we know about audit failures, not just Carillion in the United Kingdom that's had a lot of uh, uh, headlines, but uh, European wide based examples, private bank, Dansk bank, all alleged examples you have to say, but they exist. And the choice for those that regulate audit is, are we going to reform audit simply to look at the narrow financial role of auditing and spend the next five or 10 years doing that? Or are we going to seize the opportunity for the audit profession, which is to ensure that we are looking at a multi-capital sustainable economy, a transition to a sustainable financial system and to audit for that. That is the choice that we have at the moment, and that's why the work of the Court of Auditors is so important in this report. And Mervyn King wrote a book last year where he challenged the audit profession, change or die. That's what he said. We, there are management uh, consultancies, there are social accountant auditing firms without methodologies growing up, and all sorts of other people that want to say they can bring assurance to these reports. But in order to have data quality, in order to have investor confidence, in order to have good accountancy principles, it's for the audit profession to do it. And that's why this report from UAVA and this conference and what's behind it is so important and why I urge the Court of Auditors to follow your recommendations and to press the European institutions to adopt this reporting. Thank you for listening to me. A huge thank you to, to Richard. I think that sets a challenge to us, um, for those of us who are auditors in the room, and to us generally, in fact, that we should be doing something. And a perfect segue into this session, the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Now, we should have another survey if that technology works. I don't want the post-lunch slump to settle in. I want to get a little bit of energy in the room. Are we doing the survey question now or after this session? Survey's on. Okay, it's behind me. Um, again, go to menti.com, enter the code 442433. What are the main challenges for sustainability reporting in your organization? So, the options are defining what to report on, materiality, lack of support within the organization, Necessary know-how, takes too much to resource, other challenges don't know. Vote now. Bless you. Okay, while the countdown is on, I will ask our next presenters to come up. Forgive me, I'm not going to spend a lot of time introducing them. We can have a look on the website afterwards because we want more time for you guys to ask questions. Okay, so may I ask to come on stage? Titi Vjivelkari is the Auditor General for the National Audit Office in Finland. Vim Bartels, he's the partner, Corporate Reporting, KPMG Netherlands, and Program Lead for Corporate Reporting Dialogue. Welcome, come up. 
Um, Valerie Arnold, please, who's the Partner and Corporate Responsibility Lead for PwC at Luxembourg. And Mr. Phil Will Will Owen, who is the independent member for the European Court of Auditors. Welcome. Right. I think we've given enough time for you guys to answer the question. So what do we think? Try not to fall from the speech. Well, <laughs> necessary know-how, 32%. We'll come back to these and answer the questions. So starting with TT, rather than five minutes. If I can challenge you and ask you to say, okay, trust and transparency, truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, how can we do it? What are your observations? Thank you very much, um, and thank you also for remarking this morning that we have some great sunlight outside. And so, ladies and gentlemen, I'll draw a um, parallel between the sun and truth, because I can quote Elvis on this. So, supposedly, Elvis said, truth is like the sun. You can shut it out for a time, but it ain't going away. Okay. And of course, then, if we think of Elvis talking about truth, it takes me to another sphere where a contemporary of his, certain John F. Kennedy, said that the great enemy of the truth is very often not the lie, deliberate, contrived, and dishonest, but the myth, persistent, persuasive, and unrealistic. We've come quite a long way from the times of Kennedy's and Elvis. And while science now tells us that the sun actually might go away, and we live in what Mr. Howitt said, a post-truth era. It takes us to wonder, you know, what is truth and what is truth to auditors whose business trust really is. And so, in very short, I'll just take you down to the etymology of truth, which is different from that of the French word vérité, where truth actually has some sense of sustainability in it, and Verité has some sense of reporting in it. So Veritas, from Latin, it goes to depict the um, accordance of something with fact or reality, whereas it seems that in the etymology of the word truth, we find the word tree for its very robust, trustful, uh, trustworthy, faithful, loyal, honest qualities. So, truth is there in sustainability reporting. For auditors, um, the biggest challenge faced with sustainability auditing is policy coherence. How do we audit policy coherence? How do we audit what one branch of the government is doing while the other branch of government might be actually undermining all those objectives and targets? When we are bringing awareness on SDGs and sustainability reporting, oftentimes we pinpoint to the fact that it's not just about the 2% or 5% or 10% of a national or EU budget that should be looked at. It's the 100% of the budget that should be looked at. And this is something where we come to uh, truth, how do we actually say that if we're just auditing sustainability reporting and forgetting about all the rest, that we're actually giving a true and fair view or that we're um, giving a sense of whether, whether the decision makers get a true and fair view. So policy coherence is diff difficult also from a reporting uh, perspective and it will remain so. But of course, this is not a completely impossible task. Um, I think that for, for auditors, we need to understand that our role in the society is changing. Just as times have changed from the times of Elvis and Kennedy's, the role of an auditor is very different today than what it was, for example, 20 years ago. So we're not just there 
in order to chase down facts. We're also there to see that our policy makers and decision makers are doing the right things. And this is where the completeness comes in the picture. Off, so I didn't make too much noise. I'm um, delighted to say that um, Richard is joining the panel too. But over to you, Wim. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I think um, uh, I liked uh, the last words you said on completeness because of a thinking maybe as an introduction into, uh, into this session from my end. I'm working with the private sector for a long time, for 15 years now in sustainability. Uh, and uh, I've seen uh, kind of the history of uh, sustainability reporting in that regard into what we now call integrated reporting and becomes more and more uh, mainstream reporting. But I was thinking while you spoke, uh, maybe I should illustrate it on the basis of a few principles uh, that apply to reporting, and a very important one is completeness. Uh, and with that, and I link it to, to each other, uh, balance. Uh, so when mm -hmm. I started in this field as an accountant, by the way, uh, with my, my background. Um, uh, I uh, learned that uh, much of it was seen as a kind of a PR exercise. So companies uh, reporting what they, first of all, what they knew, and secondly, what they could portray themselves well with. Um, and uh, so it was, uh, I was a challenge at that time as, uh, are you auditing brochures um, from uh, organizations? Um, over time, uh, that has uh, moved into uh, more focused, more material uh, information, uh, more material in a sense of the sustainability impacts of uh, companies. Um, but then uh, we came and, and are, I think, still in that phase of what you call completeness and, and balance is a kind of another element of completeness in my view, which is, I think you said it very uh, uh, nicely, uh, that uh, it's not, tr the, the opposite of truth is not lie, but it's just, I don't know the exact words you use, but just sound like a kind of uh, portraying it well and, and saying it nicely uh, and, and a bit treat, uh, cheating rather than, uh, than really lying. Um, uh, I think we're, we're in this phase now of finding the right balance. Um, and uh, then, uh, I'll come back to it, but I want to link it to another uh, to another uh, uh, principle, which is uh, context. Um, and if you take uh, specifically uh, the GRI uh, guidelines, uh, the GRI standards, I should say, uh, they have the principle of sustainability context. Um, um, we, you might have talked already about the uh, targets that we need to achieve and the, and the boundaries that we face. Um, sustainability context is a very important uh, principle in that regard, and if we are auditors, we need to make sure that companies and our other organizations don't just talk about what they do, but also that they explain whether they do enough and whether they face specific challenges. And that is, again, uh, your point on, on completeness. The, the issue that, um, that we see as in, in our uh, teams and, and, and engagements is mostly about, not so much is, you know, what is um, uh, reported here, is that accurate? That is mostly okay or we can fix it. But the question is, is it the whole story? Uh, or do we miss elements of this story that, that an informed reader should also uh, know? Um, and that is, um, that is, I think, where, where we are now. I've spoken a long time ago um, with, um, at the time, uh, Ernst Lichteringen of uh, GRI, he, he passed away, uh, very unfortunately, um, on the topic of elephants in the room. And he and I said to each other, shouldn't we address the elephants in the room? And, and I'm pretty sure that we're getting closer and closer to the elephants in the room uh, from companies, from public sector organizations. We all know where we really fail. Honestly, everyone knows, uh, but we don't uh, have the courage yet to report it and we need to get there uh, in sustainability reporting and in uh, uh, I, what I would call mainstream or, or annual reporting uh, with that also uh, uh, integrated reporting. Financially as well as non-financially, uh, we need to address the, the elephants in the room. Uh, that'll be a next phase, I think, of reporting. I'll stop here for now. We'll get back later. Thank you, Wayne. Um, I'll hand over to yeah, just maybe to complement and make the, the panel a very, very interactive. Uh, I think we need to have system thinking in view. And because we refer to US president, I'm going to share my favorite joke. 
about President Trump, which said when he wanted to get out of COP21, America first and all that. So some journalists put in the newspaper, it's like being on Titanic and fighting for a better cabin. You get the joke, yeah? I like it very much, personally. So I think we, we need to, to really understand that, to, the, fact, the impact we have on the world, how the world impacts us, and we put on both. So I think that's very, very important, and for the sustainability context, I guess, SDG framework is very helpful. Because we know at least what we can refer to, we know it's not perfect, we know it's not for business, but we can work on the spirit of it and what we want to achieve with it. And I think that's really fundamental that people refer to how it could be the most impactful within their core business to reach the global goals. So I will say that that's for me very, very key. We come back to maturity matrix and stakeholder engagement, but just as a complement, I think it's really crucial. Sorry, thank you. Okay, no, that's great. Um, Mr. Well, Phil, over to oh, you. Well, thanks. I'm another ECA member. I wanted to take the opportunity to illustrate this discussion by talking about what the ECA has actually been doing and publishing and to take the opportunity to thank many of the several excellent auditors we have here working on this here today for all their ongoing work on building our agenda on this. Okay. In 2014, when I joined, we published 24 special reports and two landscape reviews, almost half of which concerned sustainability issues. That was no accident. Uh, it was one of our top three priorities in our strategy up to 2017, and our current strategy highlights climate change, at least, as one of the major priorities that we audit. Um, we've increased our focus on sustainability, in 2016, we much broadened the focus of our Chamber 1, which until then had largely been working on auditing EU farm expenditure. Uh, Chamber 1 now has lead audit responsibility for audits concerning the sustainable use of natural resources. That's its title. In 2017, I published a landscape review on energy and climate change. It looked at what we and other audit institutions in the EU had been auditing over the past five years and what they hadn't been auditing. And we used that to begin to fill the gaps in our audit coverage, for instance, on adaptation to climate. And in 2019, this year, we plan to publish 28 reports relating to sustainability, which is more than twice the number five years ago. So in our own small way, we're doing it and holding the Commission to account. Now, we audit sustainability, I'd identify in three different ways, three families of audit, all, all under the special reporting banner. First, we assess the reliability of EU monitoring processes. This autumn, for example, we'll publish a special report on the EU greenhouse gas inventories and another on the European Environmental Economic Accounts. These can all be found on our website as and when they appear. Second, we assess whether policy objectives are reached. In 2018, for example, we reported on the EU Floods Directive, which I recommended, amongst other things, an increased focus on green infrastructure and better integrating the effects of climate change into floods analysis so picking up recent phenomena such as more flash floods and rising sea levels. And thirdly, we highlight risks of not reaching targets. We did a 2016 report on the one in five euros commitment from the EU budget to climate action. And we actually pointed out a serious risk, which the Commission now agrees to, that the 20% target would not be reached, let alone the 25% beyond 2020. And in, de in desertification in the EU, a twin report to that on flooding at the end of last year, we found that there was not a clear, sh clear shared vision in the EU about how to deliver land degradation neutrality by 2013. I think that's SDG 15B. Uh, earlier this month, we published a widely reported uh, report on wind and solar power in the EU, where we found that half of our member states will find meeting the 2020 renewables energy targets a significant challenge. Now, where does this leave us? Well, the EU has committed to implement the 2030 agenda and to contribute to the SDGs. It's our duty as public auditors to check that the EU now acts 
and to alert our citizens if risks arise. We consider three main types of risks. First, obviously, financial risks, including not acting to mitigate and adapt to climate change, for example, will risk costing public budgets much more if we delay action. Secondly, reputational risk. In this age of distrust of politics, false news, it's vital to maintain trust in EU political institutions and that politicians deliver or seek to deliver on what they promise. An independent public audit can hold them to account on that. And thirdly, a growing phenomenon, legal risk. There's an issue that commitments made in some international mixed agreements by our political institutions may leave them open to legal risk and therefore risks of financial compensation and fines if they do not then go home and seek seriously to deliver mm. on those commitments. So we've started to focus more on SDGs. We've got a lot more to do, mainly thanks to Ava's initiative, which I applaud. For instance, this year in our work programming for next year's work, we're including examining how each potential audit proposal relates to the SDGs, and we're starting to use those SDGs as individual audit criteria. So we're actually doing it in our own audit type way. We also collaborate with other public audit bodies, um, both at the European and international level. Later this year, we're hosting a joint conference at the European level on biodiversity. And internally, we're trying to do better on sustainability, having got EMAS certification. Um, now, we've heard a lot about how auditing sustainability is challenging. I agree with that. Data quality is a big issue. But new technology, satellites, drones, artificial intelligence, mm -hmm. all have the potential to transform data avail availability and auditing going forward. I'm currently leading a very exciting audit on the use of new technology for agricultural monitoring, for instance. Finding the right metrics and audit criteria can also be challenging. I was really glad to hear a reference to the recent New Zealand budget for well-being. They often lead the way in public sector innovation. I think auditors will need to do more long-term to assess social, cultural, environmental and economic criteria alongside each other in a comprehensive way. The SDGs were a big step in that direction. And we may also have a role in monitoring the development and measurement of new economic concepts, such as natural capital, which take us way beyond GMP, etc. So I think the challenge is, another challenge, is the subsidiarity principle. We heard the Commission using this partially as an excuse. It's the member states' responsibility. It's actually often joint and several. Um, both the EU and the member states must act. The EU has climate and energy targets for 20 and 30, but it's true that member states, for instance, retain responsibility for their energy mix mm. and their subsidies. Um, and that makes making our recommendations to the Commission in particular tricky to formulate, but it can be done. So we tend to audit some topics more than others, that's true. We analysed for this conference briefly our coverage of SDGs in our recent audits. I think it's true we've covered some areas of expenditure and action more than others, for instance, industry, uh, institutional issues, climate issues now, but we've done less so far, for example, on important SDGs like zero hunger or gender equality, and I hope we can broaden our perspective. In conclusion, I think there's a huge challenge for the EU and member states to act on both climate change and the SDGs. It's got commitments on both. Um, a baby born in the EU today, as we speak, can be expected to live to the end of this century. I would expect her to see much more warming, even if the Paris Agreement succeeds, and significantly more on current trends. So I just wanted to say on a personal level that I think it's the duty of public audit to examine promised actions from our political leaders and institutions and to highlight the shortfalls and the risks. And it's a very exciting and challenging and not easy agenda, but it's one we cannot afford literally to ignore. Thank you. Thank you. Wow. <laughs>
I think that sets it up very nicely for questions. Um, I understand our first question is ready. It's, uh, Leo Brinkett, have we got uh, a mic for Leo, please? We have. Right, oh, excellent. Okay. Leo, please would you introduce yourself? Thank you. Um, I'm Leo Brinkett, a member of the Court of Auditors. And uh, previously, I was responsible for the uh, sustainability portfolio when in government. <clears throat> the dynamics of the importance and relevance of sustainability are constantly evolving and gaining both traction and momentum. Gone are the days when organizations were valued simply on the basis of their physical assets. Mm -hmm. With many corporates having realized progressively that sustainability is in their own interest since it improves their competitiveness and increases their room for innovation rather than hindering them, I consider the new main challenges to be the following. One, if we really want to live up to our collective responsibility to future generations, we must convincingly show that we consider sustainability reporting a value adder rather than just a means of limiting environmental damage. Environmental and social responsibility must be put at the forefront of our concerns by gaining a firm place in our strategy implementation as well as on the agenda of boards and senior management meetings. Most importantly, accuracy. Accuracy in sustainable reporting is of the essence, since openly communicating this accountability to stakeholders can build trust and support only if through such audits we can confirm that the shared information, I repeat, is accurate in representing any organization's environmental and socioeconomic performance. I agree fully with my colleague, Phil, uh, that independent organizations like the Court of Auditors and various SAIs, I was impressed by the presentation by our Finnish uh, representative from the uh, Auditor General rather than uh, representative. Uh, various SAIs are, together with the Court of Auditors, well placed to provide an objective view of our auditee sustainability reporting because this way they can reassure stakeholders that the information is accurate and free from bias. I think beyond verifying report data, independent assurance needs to be provided that the right kind of information is communicated. Through such a structured approach, and I emphasize the word structured, we can generate innovation, we can generate learning, and we can generate performance improvement amongst those that we audit. I will not go into the merits or technicalities of a mandatory standard for what sustainable reporting is or should be. But generally accepted standards, I think, are important and of the essence, even though data is often presented both in the corporate and the public sector by using different parameters. This explains why countries around the world are starting to ask for sustainability metrics in such reporting. What is unquestioned is that any sustainability assurance engagement must determine the scope and the plan for the engagement. Disclosing sustainability reporting information creates greater transparency for both internal and external stakeholders about one's sustainable performance and can help auditors to focus and accordingly even suggest how to improve auditors' productivity and reduce costs. Sustainability disclosure can also serve as a differentiator in competitive industries, not only fostering trust but confidence and loyalty too. The real effective benchmark will be how successful our auditees can be in integrating SDGs in their full reporting cycle. In conclusion, we will be putting our money where our mouth is when through sustainable reporting, we can show that we not only know our non-financial risks and opportunities, but also show what we do to manage them. Within this context, I feel that sustainability reporting can only be further enhanced if linkages between the circular economy, the blue economy, and the SDGs are also factored in. This can be tackled in a multi-layered manner by national governments through robust monitoring by SAIs, as well as via greater inter-service coordination between various commission DGs. Sustainability reporting is a tool to follow key sustainability trends being put into practice, to assess whether measures in place have been effective, to ferret out any slippage or greenwashing, and to identify any best practices within the EU member states and among size. 
Uh, I would like to pose two questions, one to the National Audit Office of Finland and one to KPMG and PwC conjointly. The first question to the uh, Finnish National Audit Office. Uh, in your view, how can the SAI help the INTOSAI push further the embracement of sustainability reporting? And as for KPMG and PwC, from your experience in the private sector, what is in your view the biggest liability that lies ahead of the Supreme Audit Institutions for sustainability reporting? Thank you very much, and I apologize for having perhaps overrun my intervention. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for a great uh, uh, question, and loads of questions within that, so without taking up too much time. Titi, would you like yes. to address... Thank first you very question. much, and it's a pleasure to be able to evoke the InterSci, so the Supreme Institution's uh, 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 or world organization. Mm -hmm. So within the InterSci, what we see is that actually those countries and those regions where the UN Millennium Development Goals were um, in effect, uh, were actually much faster in conveying cooperation and, and starting to work together towards a comprehensive uh, audit of uh, the SDGs. So here in the European region, we do lag behind when it comes to uh, uh, actually rolling out uh, audits and rolling out also audit cooperation uh, across uh, borders. So as Commis Commissioner um, Katainen said this morning, most of the SDG uh, problematics don't abide to borders. So we do have benefits from both the methodological side and also from the uh, audit content to work together and, and work towards a common approach. And this is one of the um, issues taken up by the InterSci. So the InterSci is developing tools and methodologies in order to help auditors worldwide to address sustainable development goal issues. Um, what I personally think is that we also need to look at ourselves and, as an institution. Um, most of our institutions are quite, uh, quite mature, so we have very well-established practice, we have a well-established well workforce, and now it's all about trying to key those practices and that workforce into a different era. Uh, we heard today about the uh, digital uh, future-proof uh, um, uh, institutions that we should also be ourselves, and this will not come about if we don't actually uh, completely reorganize ourselves in terms of getting the complete, complete picture of policy areas. So, if, for example, in my SAI, what we realized when last year we did a new strategy, uh, taking also the sustainability uh, factor in, is that the way we were organized, which was in departments and subsections, actually hindered both how information is, is uh, distributed within the organization and how well people actually take up the challenge of working in a different policy area or in a different audit type, so a different branch of our own office. And so we've now um, removed those barriers by becoming a project organization, so more of a matrix-based uh, organization where all of the employees of the institution and also external um, uh, external know-how can be brought into any audit project. And this also means that hopefully we will be able to audit policy coherence in a more flexible way. It means that we will have, hopefully, a workforce that has a broader view on different policy areas. And meanwhile, while we're doing this, we are also now studying the new government program of the very fresh Finnish government, uh, taking up its office just in these, uh, these upcoming days, which actually did its program um, based on, um, on, uh, on not the SDGs as such, but on phenomena. So it's a phenomena-based uh, program for the government, and we foresaw that and we knew that in order for us to make an audit plan that's actually mirroring what's happening in, on the government side, we need to take up our, you know, our sleeves and, and also reorganize our own workforce, our own thinking, and also set our minds into a very new era of how auditors can support, 
how auditors can, can feed back some of the information so as all those innovative uh, ways of governance uh, being able to, uh, to take up. That's brilliant. Actually, it goes back to your point in your last closing marks about Kuvad. We've got to evolve or die. So that's perfect. That's a great example. So over to you, to Wim, and then to Valerie to answer the second question. Yeah, just checking. Um, is the microphone working again? Am I yes. Home? Yes. Okay. Um, I'm just checking that I got the question right. You're asking for the, the biggest liability that could be brought to court of auditors, correct? Both. The SCIs in general. Not just the Board of Auditors, but the biggest challenge or liability which Supreme Audit institutions, uh, at least within the European context, are facing. Right, right, okay, okay. Um, yeah, I think uh, let me start with the private sector and then uh, the private sector and then link it to, uh, to public sector. So, um, in the, in the, the private sector, um, the biggest challenge that we face is honestly, I think, not so much about the accuracy of the data. I, I heard uh, already a lot about it, I have seen a lot of it, um, but um, in the end, uh, this is all about getting better uh, or getting less uh, bad. Um, with that, as long as you choose a consistent methodology, that of course is reasonable, uh, it can be sufficiently accurate to, uh, to drive performance and, and continue to report on that. Um, so uh, unlike maybe uh, the financial uh, world and financial audit, I'm a bit less concerned about the accuracy of information. I'm mostly concerned, and that is, I think, the biggest challenge, about the, again, the, uh, the completeness and about missing the most uh, relevant points. Um, and I'll give you another example uh, from the uh, private sector that links to climate change that you just referred to. Um, so, um, we have done a research, we're actually finalizing it at this very moment, which sectors in the world are not prone to climate-related risks. It are really just a few. We can only think of publishing companies and surfacing, service companies like ourselves. All the others have a major risk uh, uh, from uh, climate change or an opportunity. Now, um, imagine that uh, the auditors that, um, that audit the annual accounts of, of companies and organizations, they have done their proper job. Uh, they have audited the balance sheet and the, and the P&L in it, it all fits. Um, but the question is not about the annual accounts, the question is about the risk that is coming. Um, and you should inform your audience, if you are a, want to stay a relevant auditor, you need to inform the relevant stakeholders about the risks that are upcoming. That's to say, you need to make sure that the organization reports on it. Um, so I'm having discussions within the audit profession where our auditor, uh, financial audit colleagues uh, uh, say, well, you know, that is not our responsibility. Our responsibility is annual accounts. And that is true, but it's not the answer. The answer should be our responsibility is to provide relevant information to make sure that all the relevant information is reported. And if that's not within the boundaries of our scope, we need to expand our scope. Mm -hmm. uh, and we need to inform about the uh, long-term risks. Um, I think, and then I draw a, a parallel to the, to the uh, public sector, uh, the risk that you face is that you audit uh, the institutions and the budgets are okay, and the, the accounts, I don't know how you call it exactly in public sector, but the accounts are, are uh, okay too, uh, and you provide a clean opinion. Uh, but it appears that a major risk, uh, you just talked about the mitigation risk, for example, for climate change. Um, in, t in five or ten years' time, the budget will be completely missed uh, because you have to adapt very um, uh, quickly and very inefficiently by then. Uh, to the risk from climate change. And then the public will stand up and say, why didn't you do this five, ten years ago, and why didn't you inform us? Oh. That's a long story to say. I think uh, it is all about being complete and um, making sure that in a timely manner you report about the key risks uh, that, that, are, that are upcoming. Valerie? Sure. No, I guess uh, perfectly online with that, I think we, we all heard about the TCFD which is this you know, framework to report on climate risk that is really now becoming a norm. Uh, you saw uh, you know, the network for greening the financial system that is you know, a group of central banks coming together and say, okay, this needs to be uh, used by uh, the banks that we supervise because it's going to impact the, the financial stability. The governor of England made it 
even compulsory for, for banks and insurance to report under the TCFD, UNPI is going to ask it as mandatory from 2020 for all the signatories. So this is, climate risk is really uh, something that is really, really mm. burning. Uh, is it medium, is it long-term risk? I mean, we, we will see, uh, but, but definitely, I mean, we expect all businesses, except maybe a couple of them, to report on that. So we see really this TCFD as being a very important thing. Now, I mean, just coming back to uh, the risk we take, uh, and I think it's very similar. I mean, as big four, I think we have financial risk. And to be honest, if I look at how audit is uh, evolving, I see a lot of future for us in assurance on non-financial, because I think assurance on financial will be done by AI, short term, medium term, with little judgment left for, for people. So definitely for us, we don't convert, or we don't convert, and we don't do it in a good way, because I think we are still stuck with you know, limited assurance versus reasonable assurance. We all know what is limited, huh? limited is limited. Uh, reasonable is much better, but we are maybe not ready yet for reasonable assurance, but we need definitely to move there. Uh, I guess in terms of reputation, um, if you take a good example like Volkswagen, that has beautiful sustainability reports, but still, I mean, if you audit a sustainability report and you are you know, in the press with people who did what they did in the US, you don't feel too good. But then comes another question, is the responsibility of the management committee and the board regarding those issues? And this is a very important point. I mean, you have people driving business still with a very short-term regulatory, regulatory agenda in front of them and who has difficulties to include long-term risk. And we see it with climate, but it could be true for many things. And this is a key issue about the way they're going to drive sustainability reporting within their core strategy or not. And at the end of the day, I mean, it's not reporting which matters. It's how you embedded what is really risk and opportunity for you in your strategy. And if you do it well, you report and it's great. But what we see now is more the other way around that people report and start with a lot of difficulties to try to align a little bit with their core business, but we are not there yet, and it's a major challenge for us auditors, because we rely on what they produce. True. That's what I wanted to say about this. True. Um, I'm conscious we need to stick to time. If there's, um, do we have any other questions? Otherwise, what I wanted to ask, I'm gonna take Chair's prerogative for a sec, because I just want to ask, there's one key thing we want the, tr the title of this session was Truth, the Whole Truth, and Nothing But the Truth. What action must we take? What's the one takeaway you can say? What, what, what's the one thing we must do? No challenge. So I'm going to start with Valerie first. Um, I think we, we mentioned education. Mm. And I think education, we really need not only to see it for the young people. I mean, for the young people, I think they are more educated than us. So I don't see it as a, the real challenge. I see more education on what's going on at every level of organization. Yeah. But mainly, I mean, I'm, and I'm sure we could share the same, but we meet a lot of management committee, board, and all that. And it's a bit uh, depressing is maybe a strong word, but n we don't feel too optimistic when you talk to them. Because again, they've been, from a, they've been driving business in a certain way. Mm -hmm. The world has changed tremendously, and it didn't cope with the change. Sure. And that's, for me, a big worry. So education at every level, I will see it as a, a huge challenge. Brilliant. Thank you. Phil? Uh, for public auditors, I think, keep going on the journey we've begun, both in the Finnish Audit Office, the ECA, and many other public audit bodies. Um, keep building on what we've done. Join it up. That's the challenge of the sustainability agenda that Ava's reminding us of with her work. And base it all soundly on facts in this era of, un uh, era of untruth. We've got a responsibility to speak truth unto power and to make the facts known to everybody because we represent our citizens. Sure. Thank you, Phil. Win? Yeah, <clears throat> I would say uh, think about your uh, objective and step out of your box. Uh, and to say a few lines on that, uh, it's very important to keep realizing what auditors are for uh, mm. in the world and the role we have. Because so we are useful. 
We are very useful. No, I always, you know, I've done, a, <laughs> I've done a future of the profession a journey with our Dutch association, yeah. and we asked a very critical question. Let us disappear tomorrow. What will go wrong? Well, we all know what will go wrong. Yes. So uh, there is a clear purpose, but keep that in mind. And then secondly, because of the developments in audit, because of the developments in financial reporting, mm -hmm. we uh, are a kind of pushed in, put in, our, in a certain box, right? And we are scared to step out and experiment a little and work with data that are not exactly un, uh, mm -hmm. a certain, uh, that may not be complete, get out of that box, uh, because then we stay relevant. Absolutely. Mm. Sorry. Richard. All of those have been about um, what individual auditors can do, public auditors can do. I suppose my challenge is what we in this room can collectively do, and I think that's to take over Lindstrom's report. If the European Commission and the agencies of the European Union were themselves to integrate reporting on the SDGs, that would show such immense leadership, give such a great example. You know, and I'm very often with business audiences that feel they're being pressurised to change and then the public sector is just preaching and won't follow it itself. If we want the world to change, if we want the sustainable development goals to be achieved, everyone has to step up to the efforts. Yeah. And I think we have a responsibility <coughs> taking part in this conference to hear what Ava is saying to us and to make it happen. Yeah, thank you. And Titi? Well, I started by a quote from Elvis, so I'm going to finish with a paraphrase from Elvis. And I think it's just to kind of conclude on, on, on what you just said, on reaching out. So Eva, thank you very much for organizing this, this conference. And um, yeah, SDGs are here to stay, <laughs> never let them go. Reporting makes the agenda complete and auditors steal the show. <laughs> We've just got a new Auditor General in the UK. Can we just poach you? I make, in, make the in, uh, sessions really interesting. Wow. Huge thank you. As ever, the hour goes so quickly. I wish there were more time to ask more questions. Um, I'm so sorry if you didn't get an opportunity to ask. Please, this is not the end of the conversation. As we said, this is the start. Feedback to us and we will ask more. So huge, huge thank you as we fin conclude session three and we move on to session four. So thank you very much. So as we hand over, so lots of, hopefully lots of positives for you to take away that we are doing a lot, a lot more to do. We've got to get out of our box. It's going to be difficult. Hey, but everything worth achieving is difficult at first. Was it changes, what do they say? Um, you know, difficult at the start, messy in the middle, beautiful at the end. Yep, so that's what we want to do. Lots of things we're doing already, so lots to build on. Okay, so, I always think it's worth reminding ourselves, for, well, I'm not one of the young group, as you can probably tell, but if we play the video, we'll hear from our youth as to what they want from us.
Patricia and I'm 18 years old. Dear politicians, why does no one ever focus on the real polluters? I'm talking about airplanes and most of the cruise liners. We need solutions on a global level. A few countries can make a difference. Great. So we've heard from our future. They're telling us what they want. It actually, indulge me for one second. While I was talking to Robert Schaff, I had to condense all of these speakers down a lot. And he, but he did share with me a really good example of how this is having an impact and it's driving behavior. You think it's not, it doesn't impact on finances? It does. So um, there was a big movement within Sweden always the Nordic countries, in Sweden, where the youth decided, the 15 to 24-year-olds said, we're not going to travel. And there was a big hashtag, I can't remember, to say no flying, um, shaming, flying, shaming, shaming, flying. Somebody will correct me. And it re resulted in a 23% reduction in tra travel with that age group. So that's what the, chair, the CEO of, of uh, Lufthansa, when he came along and he was asked, answering questions, he said, that's my top concern. Anyway, with that in mind, I will hand over to our final session of the day. I'm afraid, I don't know how it is for, for you, but for me, I'm rather sad this is the last session of the day. Um, so we are delighted that Said can be here. We are, obviously, we're very, very sad that N. Mettler more than us, I think, Anne, dear Anne, is um, even sadder that she can't be here today. She's very unwell, so we're delighted that you can step in, and you are stepping in at the last minute. And uh, Anne is the head of the, well, Anne, side, from the head of the European Political Strategy Centre, reporting directly into Dr. Mr. Juncker. So please take the stage. Thank you. So... Ladies and gentlemen, dear friends, um, indeed, Anne Mettler is ill and she asked me this morning to replace her and I will do my utmost best to uh, do so. Um, I'm advisor at the European Political Strategy Center, dealing include, uh, with a number of areas, including uh, sustainable finance and, and sustainability more, more generally. Uh, so I hope to be able to share a few uh, interesting insights, uh, zoom out a bit, uh, try to show the bigger picture and then make the link also with reporting, uh, because that's what today is about. Um, let me first start by emphasizing that increasingly um, policy makers, but also other actors, are acknowledging uh, the crucial importance of social and envi uh, environmental risk to uh, the economy and to society. And as an example, I show you this uh, list uh, uh, made by the World Economic Forum showing uh, actually that in terms of likelihood and impacts, uh, clearly uh, environmental and uh, social issues are uh, on top. And what is also important is that these are very much interlinked. You, you don't see the details here, but actually uh, we all know that whenever the, there is a, a lack of water, it can be followed by, by a food crisis, it can be followed by migration, by instability, by economic problems, maybe also um, uh, military uh, adventures, etc. So uh, it, it implies uh, for policymakers that uh, they see the full picture. Yeah? And um, in terms of strategy development and, and policy making, it, uh, it means a lot. And therefore, the sustainable development goals are a very interesting framework, but we should not forget these are kind of um, orientation points. Uh, of course, uh, for the first time, a universal agenda agreed at uh, UN level, uh, but it would be a mistake to look at each of these separately. Uh, we need to see how we can actually maximize the co-benefits and uh, decrease as much as possible uh, the trade-offs that there can be when developing policies for one area or the other. Um, basically, what we should try to achieve is a society and an economy that um, is there in the safe and just space for humanity, as Kate Rewards has uh, very, very nicely uh, explained uh, through this visual. Um, it means that uh, the economy should be designed in such a way 
that we do not cross the borders, the ceiling, the ecological ceiling, the planetary boundaries, basically, because then we will at some point destroy our planet. But at the same time, the social foundations need to be solid. Huh? We need to develop an economy and a society that uh, gives a decent life to everybody. And so that's a huge challenge, uh, to stay in that uh, light green zone. Um, coming back to Europe, because developing a sustainability agenda or strategy, let's say, for Europe, implies that we try to translate the broader UN agenda into something meaningful for Europe and Europeans. Of course, we are still a world leader in terms of quality of life. Uh, many people have a good life today in Europe, despite all the challenges. Um, we are accustomed to high levels of protection and consumption. But at the same time, we are faced with structural challenges. Huh? So, for instance, the economy overall is shifting eastwards. And um, we need to ask ourselves, okay, what does it mean in the long term? And can we uh, keep our social welfare model in place at a high level um, if we are not able to uh, be a front runner in terms of clean technologies, for instance? Huh? Uh, and we have actually, in our work at EPSC, tried to look at the number of risks that we see uh, when discussing sustainability. There are a number of paradoxes that we need to understand in order to develop better policies for the future. Uh, I will quickly go through, uh, through them. And the first one, of course, is that um, a big risk would be to go for growth only. It's clear that if we do this, we will never get in the green zone. That's where we need to go. It's the zone where we can achieve a high human development, but do it within the planetary boundaries. To date, no single country in the world has achieved that. And it's not a nice to have, but it's a kind of existential issue. Huh? Uh, because we, we do not have a planet B, of course, as you all know. So it implies that um, there where today, um, let's say, high growth and high prosperity uh, comes most often uh, with higher level of pollution or unsustainable outcomes, we need to rethink our economic and, and social model uh, so that ultimately what we achieve is, is a more circular economy, resource efficient, of course, the climate neutral economy, but also one that uh, keeps into account biodiversity. And of course, it's not easy to get there. Huh? There are a number of instruments that we need to develop and use and boost. Uh, because if we don't, and we just keep growing as we do, in the way we do today, um, I think in the long term this will be not only unsustainable but unlivable. Uh, here you see some of the projections in terms of material uh, use in, uh, at the global level, but also how, um, let's say, biodiversity is uh, it, it dramatically impacted uh, by the way humans live in this planet. Um, it also implies, I believe, um, a new thinking about what is actually a successful economy uh, or a successful company, uh, for that matter. Uh, is it only GDP growth that will kind of capture, let's say, this complexity? Uh, is it only, let's say, the, um, the, the, the quarterly profit figures or market shares that, uh, that will, 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 will make it? No, of course, we need to clearly rethink that. Um, a second uh, risk is uh, and we saw it, of course, in France, for instance, with the Gilets Jaunes movement, is that sometimes there is a kind of uh, contradiction, at least at first sight, between environmental and social objectives. Um, it, uh, we know that some of the measures that we have to implement will pay off in the long term, but they will affect, they are affecting actually today already, citizens individually, regions, but also particular industries. So the question is, can we develop policies that are more anticipatory and that try to anticipate, let's say, uh, this uh, environmental social nexus altogether from day one? And that will be crucial. We have tried at the European level with the Commission to anticipate the closing of the coal mines, for instance. We know that it will happen. So why not already today uh, help these regions to develop alternative growth models. Huh? 
And we need to do the same at the, uh, I mean, for other types of uh, industries that will have to go through uh, changes, but also uh, think uh, about the impact on individuals, where we have, of course, poor people who can't afford uh, to pay more for their diesel if there are no uh, alternatives available, for instance. The next risk is that we see that forms of employment other than uh, open-ended um, full-time contracts are actually increasing dramatically. Uh, today, uh, the, the classic contracts, open-ended contracts, count for 40% uh, of all contracts and they are decreasing. So the question is in terms of keeping our social model, our welfare model uh, in place in future, um, uh, giving access uh, to uh, a number of, of social services, access to healthcare, etc., and education. Um, what will be the impact of this uh, of these trends? Especially, the impact also on a kind of intergenerational divide. Huh? We see, especially younger people, having uh, more non-standard employment, uh, maybe also more vulnerable uh, to a number of risks. We see also the risk of poverty. Uh, a, a larger share amongst youngsters than amongst older people. Uh, and in a, in, a, in a society where uh, people are aging, the, the, the demographics of Europe, this can be also a political issue uh, uh, about choices on where to invest in, be it in older people, healthcare, pensions, or in younger, in education, in uh, lifelong learning, for instance. So that's certainly something that we need to look into uh, and we need, uh, most probably, uh, develop policies so that uh, all, for all kinds uh, of contracts, uh, access to social security would be guaranteed. Then another one, speaking about aging, is of course fiscal sustainability. And what will mean for our welfare states, um, our social welfare model, the aging of the population. And there are many aspects and we can go into the details today. But as you can see, what we call the old age dependency ratio uh, will increase a lot, meaning the uh, share of people 65 plus uh, compared to uh, working age people will dramatically increase. Uh, you see, for instance, in Greece from, from about 35 up to 70, it's a, it's a doubling, meaning that uh, fewer workers will have to kind of uh, help the older generations to retire. And of course, many um, member states have put in place measures to change the pension system and to adapt to aging. Uh, but there are also member states that are reversing uh, the uh, already uh, taken initiatives. And also, it's not... Uh, it does not include, and that's why I say it's also about more, it does not include whether or not these older people uh, do, not have, do not need, let's say, other types of services, yeah? uh, uh, old age care, etc. And it does not take into account new types of needs that come up in, in our society. Yeah? We have more single parent families, uh, we need actually more uh, resources to invest in lifelong learning, etc., etc. So where can we find the revenues to do so? Especially in times where uh, some of the uh, revenues are actually decreasing due to, uh, let's say, the, the, the economic model that is changing. Uh, Labour is getting a, 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 a reduced share of, uh, of the economy. Uh, we have also uh, platforms, the digital e economy, that does not necessarily contribute uh, and does not necessarily pay its fair sh share of taxation. So all in all, big challenges that will need to uh, be addressed in the years to come. Also to find the necessary resources to invest in tomorrow's economy. Let me come then to the next risk. Oh, this one. It's the risk of turning a blind eye to outsourcing of unsustainable practices. It's not because we in Europe achieve a decoupling of growth and we are reducing our emissions that we do this at a global level. And increasingly what we see is that actually many of the emission intense production uh, facilities have shifted towards developing countries 
so we are actually exporting our problems and importing uh, emissions embodied services and products. Um, so it uh, doesn't solve the, the problem. So the challenge thereby, therefore is uh, to develop policies that will of course help developing countries to grow sustainably, uh, leapfrog over uh, unsustainable infrastructure for instance, polluting infrastructure. Uh, so that's um, one of, of the key uh, elements to, to look at. And this is particularly uh, important in the context of a population that is growing. For instance, Africa, uh, we all know that by uh, 2050, the African population will double in size and by the end of the century, it will be multiplied by four. So that's quite a dramatic increase. And so can we create a global economy and society that helps these people to have a decent life too, uh, but without actually destroying our planet? Bring me to the role of each and one of us. Uh, we all have a responsibility too in uh, transiting to the economy and society of tomorrow. And consumption, our own consumption is quite often the elephant in the room. Um, our lifestyle, the living space, the energy use, the meat consumption, the car use, the way we go on holidays, all of these contribute to the uh, unsustainability of our society. And of course there are many public policies that can kind of help citizens to get aware of this uh, issue. Uh, it's about spatial planning, it's of course about research and innovation in order to develop uh, new recycling and, 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 and recycling facilities and etc. It's about how we are um, designing our taxation system. So there are so many things we can do, but it's, uh, it's not easy. Then a uh, final risk I want to mention is innovation does not necessarily lead to sustainability outcomes. Yes, innovation will be crucial. Uh, we need technology, we need uh, solutions. And in this regard, it's a pity to see that others are catching up much faster, like China and uh, South Korea, in terms of spending. Um, but even, even so, uh, of course, innovation uh, can also uh, mean that things become obsolete. Uh, an iPhone will be replaced by a new version of the iPhone, and then the next year another one. Uh, the same applies to the collaborative economy. Um, it can uh, give access to a number of services and products for more people who, co who couldn't afford it before. That's a good thing. But on the other, uh, other hand, it can also mean that uh, you know, resources are used more, more often. i give you the example of ride-sharing. It's proven that actually ride-sharing apps increase the number of kilometers overall. The same applies to home-sharing which can put a pressure on the prices of homes in certain areas and therefore be socially unsustainable. So, nevertheless, innovation crucial, but we will probably have to think in terms of mission-oriented innovation, huh? of innovation that leads to uh, sustainable outcomes for our society. And you know that the Commission is developing these policies for the years to come. Uh, last few slides linking it to the real economy. I think it's important indeed in, uh, before this audience to uh, emphasize that increasingly we all agree that sustainability risks are not only about the planet, about saving the planet. Uh, these are also financial risks. And uh, there are the immediate physical risks, which will impact, of course, in the first place, uh, insurance companies, but after uh, that the whole economy through the banks and every, everybody connected to the insurance system. But there are, of course, also liability risks. Uh, at some point, uh, I guess that uh, people will get angry and try to find out who is responsible for the emissions, and this they may go to court. And then finally, there are the transition risks. Um, uh, industries that are not able to uh, change themselves, to transform themselves on time, will disappear. So that's uh, important to make visible. And not only the risks need to be made visible, but also the opportunities. 
we see that in recent years, for instance, environmental technologies uh, are uh, becoming increasingly important and these sectors are doing very well. So investors and consumers need to know that. And so we need to connect the world of finance to the sustainable one. Therefore, transparency is crucial uh, in order to recognize the risks and uh, size the opportunities, but also mitigate the risk of greenwashing. Uh, private initiatives have seen the light, uh, for instance, specialized rating agencies, uh, etc. Also private companies that develop their own metrics uh, to capture, let's say, environmental and social elements in to what they, they do. But the challenge here is that um, the criteria used by these companies or rating agencies and the underlying data, they are rarely aligned. So uh, it's important to bring everybody around the table and try to find solutions for these challenges. And the Sustainable Finance Action Plan that was adopted last year uh, is a, a good basis, we believe, uh, to help reorienting capital and also triggering corporate uh, behavior. And they will have to uh, kind of impact all the players throughout the finance value chain uh, because that's what is needed if you want to change the financial world. Um, and in, uh, in, in, in this regard, it's maybe as a final statement, interesting just to mention that tomorrow, and maybe somebody told you already, uh, the Commission will uh, publish the uh, reports from the technical expert group on taxonomy and on a number of things. So that will be a next important step uh, towards uh, real action. So to conclude, it's time for a systemic change. I will share you the slides, so you, I will not go through all the conclusions. Um, but systemic change means that we need all encompassing uh, changes across all market sectors uh, and value chains from product design up to consumption. And for this to happen, metrics are, of course, crucial. Huh? Uh, it starts with good data, and uh, this needs to be drawn from good reporting. And so, therefore, your work and that of your colleagues is crucial to get there. Thank you very much. Wow, a huge thank you. You wouldn't believe that he'd only had about, I don't know, five hours notice? Well. That was excellent. Thank you very much. Um, I just want to say a quick shout out. We have as many online listening in to this presentation, I'm delighted to report that, from countries far away as the USA, Brazil, and the UAE. So we are really, what we're doing in Europe today, it's not just within Europe, it's been heard, heard all around the world. So um, Saad had to leave, he had to go to another uh, meeting. So I'll ask Wim to come up again. We couldn't let him escape with only one session. I wish we could do that for all of the speakers. So for the agenda 2030, over to you. And I'm uh, getting more nervous now. I know that there's so many people watching from around the world. Uh, thank you all for uh, what, looking at uh, this, uh, this, uh, this seminar today. Um, a final a few comments from, um, from my perspective. And I told you in the previous section, uh, sec uh, session, um, my background is in the private sector. Um, I thought about the potential uh, lessons that we can learn in the private sector and then thought myself, and would they apply to the public sector uh, auditing and auditors as well? And, and my conclusion is yes. So um, I'm going to share you uh, my uh, five areas to work on as auditors and the uh, four challenges that I uh, see. Um, I called it uh, this last session relevant audits. Uh, we talked already about it in a bounded world, and I think this full day is about a, a bounded world. It comes back in every... Uh, session. Um, what you uh, see here on screen is a picture that I actually took about uh, 15 years ago. Um, at the time, I worked with an oil and gas company. Uh, I can name it. I think it was uh, Shell. Um, and this is uh, one of their uh, Nigeria, Nigerian uh, wells. Um, so we went down there as part of an audit. And what you see is just the world at that time. So um, the water is a little uh, polluted. Um, and in the back, I think you have noticed a flame um, in the oil and gas world, you call it a flare. Um, it's um, a burning of 
gas. Um, and if you explore gas, uh, sorry, if you explore oil, uh, gas comes with it automatically. And you can do two things with it. You can either bring it to a production uh, facility, uh, get it into uh, liquid natural gas, or you can burn it. At the time, Shell didn't have a real opportunity to bring it to the coast. It was too far away. It was much easier, it was much cheaper to just burn it. Um, and this is what happened 24 hours a day, um, seven days a week, 52 weeks a year. By now that all has changed because we know that we live in a bounded world and the energy sector, of course, is amongst them realizing that uh, they have to change and be part of the uh, ad uh, adaption to a, a low carbon uh, world. Uh, so we have insto, uh, to step into the future. Also, we as auditors, that's our, uh, our next as, uh, uh, exit. But I thought it might be good to, again, a kind of as a recap of today, um, make sure that we all understand where we are. Um, and as, as I said, I'm going to show you examples from the uh, private world, but again, uh, you can equally uh, apply it to public sector. So this is the first notion. We know nowadays that financial information does not tell uh, the full uh, value story. This is um, a picture that shows in 1975 you could explain uh, about um, uh, uh, 84, 85 percent of a company's value by the value of its physical uh, assets. Uh, by now, that has turned around. Uh, you can only explain 16 percent of a company's uh, value. Uh, this is uh, Standard & Poor's uh, 500 index, by the way, uh, by its physical assets. All the rest is intangible. It's other uh, elements. It is intellectual capital. It is innovation. It is reputation. Uh, and part of it is sustainability. We don't know the numbers for that yet, but we know at least that uh, financial information does not tell uh, the full story. We also know that we have 17 big problems to solve, and that was talked about uh, throughout the day. I don't have to go uh, through this. Um, it was just uh, shown by Said uh, also. Um, we know that the planet will have no excuse uh, to us. Um, it will just uh, continue. And if we cross the planetary boundaries, the world will continue, but what about us? Um, and as Said said, we also have to carefully look into the uh, social uh, foundations. Um, we are yet um, at the current path, we are far beyond the planetary boundaries and we are by no means above the uh, social uh, thresholds. That's the world. Uh, we're in. Um, and then it's interesting to see that financial reporting is still leading. Um, I deliberately, of course, uh, put the two uh, financial reporting frameworks on top and enlarged them a little. Uh, but this is also reality. So um, I learned from the report being issued uh, last week, only two European institutions issue a sustainability report. You may be a bit disappointed by that, I can imagine. Um, you might think that the private sector itch must, is much further ahead. Uh, you're right in terms of the, um, the time, the number of years that the private sector is working on this, but we know that uh, by no means um, percentage-wise uh, companies are better than the public sector. Um, the largest uh, reporting framework is still under uh, 10,000 uh, reporting uh, companies. Uh, we at KPMG, every two years, we do uh, research into uh, sustainability reporting amongst the 100 uh, largest companies uh, in 50 countries. And we are now at a, a percentage of about uh, two-thirds, so 66, 67 percent. You can say, well, that's quite a lot. It is, but it are only the largest 100. Um, and normally, uh, and we see that because we also track the largest 250 in the world, and they are at uh, over 90%, the largest uh, organizations go first. So if this is the number from the largest 100, you can imagine what the smaller companies are doing. So just encourage you a little that um, the public sector may look uh, behind, um, but the uh, private sector has also a long way to go, specifically with the uh, non-financial uh, reporting uh, uh, frameworks and adapting to those. If we all take this into account then, and you ask the question, uh, what is it what we need knowing this brief uh, summary? Uh, well, uh, I think we need uh, six uh, things. Uh, one is uh, we need uh, performance 
within or against the planetary boundaries. Um, I named earlier this sustainability context principle of uh, GRI. It's a very, very critical uh, principle by now. Uh, we have, it's, it's great if you reduce your carbon emissions by 15%, but it's not enough. Uh, it's great if you uh, work on your, um, uh, on your human rights, but you should really look at the social thresholds, and we could go on and on. So the boundaries, reporting within or against the boundaries is critical. Uh, it should be focused on the key areas of value creation and destruction. It are the 17 problems. Uh, we should not forget that uh, many uh, companies, many multinational companies, are larger than uh, economies, than countries. So uh, the private sector and companies have a critical, important role to play, and they should focus on the key areas of value creation and uh, destruction. It should be in a comparable manner, uh, otherwise uh, we can't track performance for the system as a whole. It was discussed today. It should, of course, be in an efficient way, otherwise it will not be cost effective and it will not happen. Then I'll come back to it, it should, and, and Said was saying, interestingly also, or making similar comments, it should be linked to the current world of financial focus. Now, you might that, find that very interesting, taking into account this previous uh, picture where I showed the financial um, reporting frameworks are the largest, and we should work more on the non-financial. Um, the reason uh, I personally include this one is because uh, my view is that uh, if we want to get there, the fastest way is via the uh, financial uh, route, if you like. Um, I experienced that at companies, sustainability officers, sustainability departments have for long been kind of isolated individual departments doing their thing, not really connected to the board, um, and at the end of the year uh, issuing a sustainability report. All good work. Uh, but the moment it becomes a financial issue, either from reputation or revenues or, um, or a financial risk, the CFO gets in, suddenly you have investment budget, it becomes more relevant for the company as they see it. Uh, with the sustainability land, you may not like it, but it is the world it is. And I could see that at uh, country and institutions level, it works uh, similarly. You know better than I, but um, uh, at the moment we link it to financials, I think it really helps. And, of course, uh, we need it urgently. So uh, what about audit in all of this? And I think I have uh, two uh, encouraging messages uh, for you. Uh, the first is there is an increasing belief that accountants will save the world. That is encouraging, right? Um, this is uh, Peter Bucker. He's the chairman uh, of the CEO of the World Business Council for Sustainability. And his uh, reason uh, to, to take this uh, uh, statement is that he says, we need data, we need comparable data, we need targets in order to track our performance. And who can work on this with the right controls around it in our accountants? So uh, that is the first encouraging um, uh, comment. Uh, the second is that there are also people who uh, turn it around and say, save the world because it's the only planet with accountants. <laughs> so that is maybe even more encouraging. And uh, why is, the, um, uh, is this important? Uh, because I think this is another uh, uh, notion that uh, accountants are critically important. I promised you five uh, things to uh, work on, and I take them, uh, take you through them very quickly. The first is uh, to uh, help with ensuring uh, that the right topics are being addressed. In the private uh, sector, you are used to what is called materiality assessments, and I took it also from the uh, report uh, that you uh, released uh, last week. This is of the uh, European Investment Bank. This is the way um, that the results of their process to track what is uh, critically important for the European investment bank in terms of sustainability to report upon. And these processes, again, you can equally apply to other organizations, institutions, uh, and even countries, I think. Um, what can uh, accountants do in this? Well, first of all, uh, they can help in making sure that these uh, processes are um, are established properly, that they have the right levels of control, the right governance around it, um, and uh, that, they, that they function properly. That's, that's typically work of accountants. Um, secondly, um, we, with all the knowledge that you have or can gain, you can also be 
uh, what we normally call a critical friend and say, are you really sure that this topic is so low on your radar? Shouldn't this be higher? So to have the right level of discussions. I come to the challenges in a second, but this is my first area that I would recommend all of us to work on. Uh, second, um, to uh, connect uh, impact to uh, dependencies. Um, that relates also to that earlier point that, that I made about linking it to, uh, to financial. The moment, and I very much liked uh, your comment earlier today uh, in, with respect to climate change, saying what uh, happens if we don't act on this? And if you think about uh, climate change again as an example, for long in the private sector companies have looked from uh, left to right. What is the impact of us on the environment and can we do a little to reduce our negative impact and improve our uh, positive impacts? Uh, then, um, and I must say, it is um, for a large, to a large extent, I think, because of the, the Task Force on Climate-Related Financial Disclosure, TCFD, that, put, uh, that has put um, uh, uh, climate change on the radar as a pure financial risk. Um, I'm a member of the TCFD, so I also present on their behalf, and every time I do, uh, I say to the audience, the TCFD doesn't care at all about climate change. We don't care whether the world uh, increases with two degrees or four degrees. It doesn't matter. The only question is, what does it mean for companies? And that's the only focus of the TCFD. And here I should then say the primary focus, because there are many uh, people uh, within the TCFD who also look from left to right. But this is very important. Uh, also, if you think about institutions, if you think uh, about uh, countries, okay, you know, uh, let's not work on those sustainability targets. But what happens if we don't? Um, what is our dependency from sustainable uh, development? And we as auditors can uh, clarify that with our knowledge about risks, with our knowledge about the impact on uh, uh, financial investment budgets uh, and in the private sector uh, revenues. Then uh, the next uh, area is to get prepared for uh, new auditing areas. I just took one example. Um, this is um, DSM. Um, what is um, uh, relevant uh, mostly here, or the, the, the message I want to give with this, if you look at the uh, assurance report in here, uh, it doesn't talk about the data only. It talks about all the information. We uh, provide assurance on the full uh, report. And um, that means that we have to learn to look into text, to consider balance in reporting, to look into completeness. And I would say get prepared for that. Uh, then um, a final area, uh, sorry, the fourth area, uh, not the final, is to contribute to reporting frameworks and indicators. Um, I have learned myself we are very uh, capable of um, helping developing indicators with our knowledge of how reporting criteria work. So I would encourage uh, public auditors, um, just as uh, fin uh, financial auditors in the private sector, to uh, contribute to the debate and the development and not leave it to the frameworks only. Uh, finally, uh, help assist in uh, setting up processes and internal controls. We underestimate sometimes uh, the knowledge we have as auditors about controls, about uh, how proper processes uh, work. Um, and even if you don't know anything about sustainability, uh, you can still uh, contribute a lot to uh, reporting against the SDGs as been talked about uh, today. Uh, I have one minute to uh, talk about the four uh, challenges. They have uh, come across, I think, today uh, a few times also in the previous uh, session. Um, and I'll, I'll say it in a, in a few words. The first is, yes, we have to develop uh, um, into new areas of, of expertise. Education is critical. The next generation may be further than some of the more uh, experienced auditors um, uh, in, the, in the field. Um, but uh, to get beyond financial performance, to start understanding how in the private sector business models work, in the uh, public sector how country models work or uh, public sector models work in, it, in its comprehensiveness is, uh, is of key uh, importance. Uh, the top, uh, sorry, the bottom right says uh, uncertainty and uh, future orientation. Everything that we're looking into here is not fixed, cannot be predicted, uh, has a lot of uncertainty around it. That is difficult. I know I'm a financial auditor by background myself. That is difficult for financial auditors. We're used to IFRSs, 
uh, auditing standards. You audit uh, on the basis of everything that's been written down as becoming more and more detailed. And this is uh, not so detailed. It's uncertain. It's future-oriented. This is my uh, previous comment. Uh, get out of the box. Uh, just try. Do. Uh, start learning. Uh, you need new skill sets uh, because uh, you need to look into other types of information, information that is more uncertain by nature, carbon emissions, you can't, well, you can measure uh, carbon emissions, but then still there's uncertainty in the output, and we have to get used to that and learn also how to look into things like balance explanations about performance and, and performance development. And then finally, uh, the relevance of the profession. I said that in the panel, keep that uh, in mind. Um, start uh, thinking about, to the extent you haven't, uh, how relevant we are and how we stay relevant in the private sector as well as in the public sector. So, uh, and I know it's a challenge, so that's why it's on this uh, slide. These are my four final uh, comments, and I think I'm uh, 20 seconds over my one minute. Sorry for that. <laughs> Uh, but thank you for listening and uh, thank you for organizing this conference, it's great. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you, thank you, Wim. Um, please don't leave the stage, take a seat. Um, we would love for um, Anime Turtleboom to, to start the deliberations and, and start the interventions. And she's a member of the European Court of Auditors. Please, if you'd like to come up, that would be great. In the meantime, I would just say, I feel like the whole day, I feel like a bit like the Grim Reaper every time I'm coming along. You can see it's because I'm trying to cut your brilliant speech. Okay. Yes, thank you very much. And Eva was so kind to ask me to kick off the public forum, but... Uh, I think there is so much already has been said, and I think there are maybe also a lot of questions for, from the public itself, so I would like to, I will be very, very brief. But I would like to start with really thanking Eva for organizing uh, this, this conference. I think, Eva, you know, timing is everything in life. You are just, after all the youth who, who did the climate strikes, you come after your review, but also just before the next MFF, and I hope that this uh, conference can also have an influence on all stake stakeholders. Because actually, what I learned today during the conference is that, yes, there is still a lack of awareness. There is a lack of data. There is a lack of reliable data. And actually, as an auditor, that's key to us. If the data are not, if, if our basic material isn't there, we still have a problem. So I would uh, like to point out just two things uh, and my if you ask me what is next, then I see, first of all, I think all stakeholders need to be on board. And that means it's not only the parliament, not only the commission, but also, and I feel from time to time, it was a little bit like the elephant here in the room, the member states, because it's true as a court of auditors, we address ourselves often to the European Commission, but as 80% is shared management, it is also the member states who need to be on board because we rely on their data. And if we want to go ahead and we want to achieve the goals in 2030, it's key that the member states are there. And if we hear from time to time the public statements of leaders, political leaders of some member states, then I think that here in the room, we are all fellow advocates of sustainability. But outside this room, it's, I think, less uh, active as today, although we are still in Europe, the continent where everyone is officially on the same page. It's not all over the place and not all over the world. But that also means that we need to have the citizens on board because we haven't talked today, no one talked about the NIMBY mm -hmm. syndrome, not in my backyard. Eh? Said pointed a little bit out during his conference that he said, uh, well, uh, there is a huge difference between the micro and the macro level on we are all in favor of more sustainability. But if we need to leave our car at home and take the bicycle, take our bicycle, then it's often a, a much more uh, complicated. So I think that uh, the member states are very, very important also for us because they go together with the European uh, Commission. And then a second, my second takeaway for the next uh, years is that we, I think also at auditors, we need to invest more in data and impact on the lack of sustainability. If we take a look that, for instance, there are millions of people on risk of poverty, if we don't invest enough in 
sustainability. There are 15% of the people who are really living in houses, who are barely, you can call it a house. If we don't invest in sustainability, the gap between the haves and the have-nots will increase. So I think there is still a lot of room for improvement. And Phil already pointed it out that as a court of auditors, we invest a lot in sustainability and also thanks to Eva. But I think we also need to invest more in what if there is a lack of sustainability? What will then be the social, uh, the impact on uh, social inequality, on poverty? And that's actually what I take away today, that is what we are doing is on the right track, but we need also to go mm. one step further ahead because otherwise uh, we, will, we will maybe not um, uh, fill the expectation that is there uh, among uh, the citizens. And to conclude, of course, as auditors, we are key for trust and for transparency because in a period of a lot of fake news, it is key that we can uh, say that these, these data or the greenwashing, this, was, this part of the data is actually greenwashing and this part of the data is actually real working on sustainability. Mm -hmm. And I can give a lot of examples on that, but uh, of course we are actually, I think we should go uh, we should hand by hand should go together with the policy makers because mm -hmm. we can help them also to make their data very reliable. Thank you. Thank you, that's excellent. Um, it's great to have that day reflected because I've really enjoyed it, but it's nice to hear from the audience. I sometimes do worry a little bit. We are preaching to the converted. I think <laughs> us, we are all quite positive and that's why we're giving up a day. When you're here, that means somebody else is not doing your work for you. You're passionate about this subject. But anyway, your last chance to ask questions on the way forward on the 2030 agenda. We have about just under, we have seven minutes. Have any burning questions about this or anything else? We have Wim here. And uh, thank you, Anime, it's, it's decided to step up. But we still have uh, Phil uh, Lazarus here. We have Ava. Speak now or forever hold your true. Well, oh yes, we have a question, otherwise, more escape. There's a gentleman over there, please. Thank you. Uh, Kun van Bommel from the Free University of Amsterdam. I have a question for uh, Wim. Uh, mainly about data, Wim. It's um, in the sense of quantitative versus qualitative data. Uh, I think I don't insult auditors if I say they may prefer more hard facts and quantitative data, when I hear you, I can see you keep the door a bit open for a story, let's say, for a qualitative story within, in particular, I'm talking about integrated reports. So how do you see this balance between hard, verifiable, quantitative data and integrated reporting and sometimes the need to tell maybe more a story, uh, which is maybe more <coughs> uh, familiar to the sustainability reports uh, uh, yeah, and the history um, of them. Thank well, you. Particularly also from an auditing perspective. Yeah, I think there are a, f a few comments to make on that. The, the first is, um, uh, and, and this is again my, my private sector uh, experience, but um, when uh, a company starts with, with sustainability reporting, um, it's, it's quite different from, uh, from financial reporting. So, the, you know, they don't have the data they have a kind of indication, they have a kind of estimation. Um, and that is because it's part of a journey. Um, so, um, I, and, and I, I mean, I don't know, but there's a risk when you say like, we only want hard data um, to be audited, that very little data really make that threshold. And then you can say, well, the good thing is then at least the data that we have is hard and audited, etc. But the question is, did we re do we really uh, uh, help the, the overall system by not allowing other data? And uh, in my own experience, we have had companies with a kind of weak data, a weak in terms of uh, the scope, in terms of the way that the information is collected, in ways in terms of, um, of the definition. Um, but um, if you, I mean, you know, you should not work with, um, sorry for the word, with crap data, right? So you should make sure that it is serious, that it is um, uh, public, uh, that, so that it is explained, um, and that it is reasonable. 
Um, but if you do that, then you can help the company by auditing to get to the right level, uh, uh, right quality of, of data. So that's why I leave that door open, as you say, to, to do some qual more qualitative data uh, and estimations rather than hard quantitative data. The second comment I have is um, uh, why are quantitative data important? Um, they are important to assess and track performance. Um, uh, what are you interested in? It's, uh, in the, again, in the private sector, but I think I can make a parallel with, with the public sector. Uh, financial data are interesting to see whether you made your budget, whether you're in uh, or over uh, in private sector, whether you made your profit, and whether that's a certain percentage, right? And that's a, that number doesn't change so much. I mean, nowadays we have uh, lower uh, return rates, but uh, it doesn't change so much. So you, a company that makes minus two is making a loss, and it's a small loss. A company that makes plus 15% is doing quite well, normally. Um, so we, we have a kind of um, percentage that we can use over time. For sustainability data, you're interested in more relative data. You're interested in uh, improvements. So uh, if it's negative performance, does the negative performance go down? Uh, are you improving your negative impact on, the, on society? With that, um, quantitative data is, is relevant. It's relevant that it's high quality, but as interesting is what is the trend over time. Um, so that is my second caveat to really hard quantitative uh, data. And then the third is uh, data uh, don't always mean so much when you don't have an explanation. And that's where the tricky thing comes in. Um, so um, I can... Um, I have to, to, um, uh, to uh, kind of uh, make it up now, but you know, I can do... Um, I can show a imp performance improvement of 5% um, where my target in two years' time is 10%. And I can say two things here. One is I'm halfway of my target. I'm, really, I'm sure I'm going to make it uh, because in year one I'm already halfway. The other is um, I'm at 5%. I know the first year is more difficult than the... Uh, sorry, the second year is more difficult than the first year. So I'm not sure that I'm going to make that target, but I'll do my very best. Both can be true. Um, but here it, here it becomes interesting. The first is much more has a positive connotation, if you like. The second may be more uh, balanced. I don't know. I mean, I'm just making it up. Uh, but I'm just giving an, a brief example to say the text, the explanation, can be as important as the data itself and, and, and gives color to it. Um, mm -hmm. So that's why I think it's very important to look really into that as well and not only into the, into the data. Just to add to that, I think going back to the point of the, the young people, it's how we present that information, so it's accessible, yeah. uh, available, reliable, and, yeah. you know, for accountability. Sorry. Yeah. I, ha I must resist the urge to add my two pennies worth. Um, any other question before we head off to the final There's session? There. There's another question there. Around oh, over the there. Third round. Yes. Thank you, Gaston. <coughs> Thank you. Um, yeah, in view of what uh, the urgency expressed by our younger presenters um, earlier today, they said we need action now, we want to see it acted. So I was wondering whether Wim, uh, from the private sector perspective, and Titi perhaps from the public sector perspective, if they see such an urgency not only in their own organization, but particularly with their auditees, with their clients, is there also such a feeling of urgency that more and more needs to be done on these SDGs? Because for many people, there's a lot of talking, but where is the walking? Thank you. You go first or TD? Yeah. Here we go. Well, thank you very much for giving me the opportunity. Um, I think that the pressure has to come from very different angles. So, first of all, within audit institutions, we face the pressure of our own workforce. That is, staying relevant to our societies means that we need to take up new innovative methods, new ways of working together. And this is not always the case when you're a public institution, you have very long careers running over a long period of time, and when you need to change the course of action, well, you need to kind of both do capacity building and then bring new partners in. 
So the urgency, in one way, yes, but in another way, no, because of this, this kind of lag that comes from um, an institution having adopted its own culture, its own working methods. And in order to break through, I think that um, we need to listen to outside stakeholders. Very many of our Latin American colleagues, actually, are reaching out to the civil society. In order to create internal pressure within the in institution, by hearing what citizens are saying, hearing what's actually there in the terrain, we kind of lift our eyes from just the data and the reporting to, well, how does that translate to the real world? And by bringing in that loop, I think they may be, succeed better in having a sense of urgency also within the organization to innovate, to create new, new, uh, new ways of working. But uh, having said that, I think that a lot of our public sectors have learned through the digital disruption, we've learned that we can't just stay put. And there are very many um, you know, inofficial networks happening. Uh, there are also official networks, but the inofficial networks, for example, in, in uh, Finland, mean that very many public servants are trying out new things, new contacts, working out different uh, solutions to problems they didn't foresee because they worked in a silo culture before. Yeah. Now they're breaking through those silos, trying to work together and trying to be creative. So I think in one sense, it's not just for the institution itself, it's also for every individual within that institution. Perhaps in smaller countries, it's easier to be agile, but then again, we will be glad to, you know, preach on, on our practice uh, whenever that is uh, required of us. Um, a new practice will, will come and evolve. Thank you. For the <coughs> private sector, my, um, uh, my blunt answer would be no. Um, my more nuanced answer is uh, uh, some, more and more, are getting it. Uh, so I'll give you first, you ask two things actually. What about your own organization? Um, and I can run that to accountants, it's a kind of the same. Um, within uh, our firm, uh, so KPMG in the Netherlands, um, so I'm in it for 15 years. Um, I was seen as a, as a kind of, a, how did I call it again, like a, like a tree hugger, right, when I started in 03, 04. Uh, that was a strange career move, right, the strangest I'd ever seen. Um, um, since, I think, two, three years, um, things have changed. Um, why has it changed? Uh, because, uh, first of all, uh, clients start to talk about it. Second, you can read it in the paper. You could read it for 15 years, by the way, but I read it a bit differently than others. Uh, but you now it's you know all and everywhere. And thirdly, um, um, there's an increasing uh, uh, notion that uh, this will have a financial implication. Um, so uh, amongst my colleagues, right? So now I ha we have high level of interest within our firm for for sustainability, and something needs to happen here. Uh, then the question: Who? Um, and then, um, so far, uh, my colleagues, I'm generalizing, of course, um, don't all take it yet as we need to do it. It's, yeah, that's for the clients. We need to help them, of course, but it's for the clients. Um, I think as we're discussing it today, it goes a little further, but um, we're on the track. Um, um, the uh, companies, um, you know, many have related their performance to uh, SDGs. We're working on the SDGs. We're contributing to a better world. Um, but when you look in reality, you say, well, first of all, it are only the positive things that you name here, not the negatives. So where are your negative contributions to the SDGs? And secondly, you're saying that you contribute, but you don't answer the question, is it enough? Um, so um, um, I, I think, in, again, in general, I would say companies still are in that phase of trying to show off uh, well, uh, we're doing good, um, mm -hmm. we're helping the world, as you know, as these SDGs ask, but not yet, uh, call it, hitting the, the, the heat point of, um, of uh, what is it, what I really need to do. If I'm in a chemical sector and I really would need to be sustainable, I should stop my production tomorrow, right? I mean, that's the real, that's, uh, we all know that's a problem and it's a no-go, but to dare to, to, to make that statement, internally or, or even externally, we're, we're far from that, apart from some leaders, right? So we should 
there are some real good examples. Um, the majority. That's, a, that's yeah. a great point to end on. I think in terms of trust, transparency, hmm. we've been absolutely honest. It's great to hear that. Negative reporting against SDGs. I like it. Hmm. Anyway, um, a huge thank you to my panel. Obviously, Said had to leave, so thank you so much, and thank you, Anne May, for the intervention, and sure. to you for questions. <laughs>
will change or adapt. We will. We will have to transform. I think the question is how this will be done. And for me, sustainability is very much a bear about preparedness. So I would like to thank everyone for coming here today. And of course, I will also like to thank everyone who made this conference possible, our speakers, our moderator, and not the least, the organization team behind this. Thank you very much. I hope you all feel as inspired and as motivated and I, as I do. And I also think we have some good examples to take with us and also to spread and that you all continue working on sustainability and actually also on our common future. So thank you very much for coming here today. <laughs>